Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records, and this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back, or welcome, if this is your first Vinyl Monday episode. Uh, this is the series where I sit down once a week and I just talk about records that I like. Before I kick things off, I want to give a quick thank you to you guys for 15,000 followers on Instagram. I feel like every episode we've had a new milestone. I, I guess that's just how things go. And I'm definitely planning something to celebrate both 15k on Instagram and 1k here on YouTube. Uh, I'm really excited to have this record on Vinyl Monday. I've been wanting to cover it for a while and I just recently revisited it and remembered how good it was and how how cool it was so I wanted to show this off to you guys this week we will be talking about Pink Floyd's first record the Piper at the Gates of Dawn oh wait sorry the Pink Floyd uh, this record is Piper at the Gates of Dawn by the Pink Floyd as you could see on my spine if it weren't so beat up but this record was released before Pink Floyd dropped the the from their name. So we have the Pink Floyd on the spine and just Pink Floyd on the cover. Ugh. This, my copy right here, is an original US copy. This is one of the more fragile albums in my collection, so I don't get it out and play it as much as I'd like to. I'm gonna be really, really careful taking it out of this plastic. And I bought this from the record store where I went to college. I got this for a pretty good deal considering, and I'm really, really happy to have this. This is a mispress. There's quite a few spelling goofs on the labels and on the jacket. Instead of Power Talk H, we have Power Roach. We also have Take Up My Stethoscope and Walk instead of Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk. That was quite the tongue twister. And Chapter 24 is spelled with two Ps. Like, the other ones I can kind of understand, but come on, misspelling chapter? One of my favorite things about Piper at the Gates of Dawn is the cover art. This front cover was photographed by Vic Singh, and for this photo shoot, he asked for the band to dress in really bright colors. Uh, considering this was 1967 Pink Floyd, that was no issue at all for them to do. They dress like most any other British psych rock band, which was lots of color, Lots of crazy patterns, a little bit of sparkle in there, as you can see on their shirts and jackets. And maybe the thing I love the most about this cover is this sort of kaleidoscope effect. This photography was done on something called a prism lens, which you would fix to your camera and it would kind of do that uh, kaleidoscope thing. And fun fact, this lens was given to Vic Singh by who else? George Harrison. Why can't I get a prism lens for free from a beetle? What the fuck? Yeah, wow. I'm not kidding when I say, you know, these guys from these British bands, they, everybody literally knew everybody. I guess London was a very small town back then. And if we flip this jacket around to the back, we see that the art on the back cover was actually drawn by Sid Barrett himself. This art is just super psychedelic. It's so cool. I am a sucker for some super psych album art, and this is pretty up there. So the lineup for Piper at the Gates of Dawn was as follows. You have frontman Sid Barrett. He's the one right here. He also played guitar. Roger Waters on bass, and I'm positive he has some uncredited Roger Waters screeches on here. <laughs> Rick Wright playing the organ and piano, and Nick Mason on drums. Uh, he's actually credited as Nicky on this record. I don't know why I think that's so funny. I enjoy chatting about Piper because this is a point in the band's history that maybe casual fans wouldn't know too much about. When EMI had signed these guys, and they, <laughs> I don't know how else to phrase this, they didn't really know what kind of band they'd signed. So EMI gave them a lot of control creatively. They could basically put out whatever kind of album they wanted. But there was a catch, and the catch was the label wouldn't be paying for studio time. From my research, this sounds like commonplace in the 60s, but it seems weird and 
bad to me. Ugh. So the band was required to record at EMI's studios, which we now know as Abbey Road Studios, the Abbey Road Studios, but EMI didn't pay for it. This record was produced by Norman Hurricane Smith, and he actually does the drum fill on Interstellar Overdrive. Hmm. During production of Piper in March of 67, Pink Floyd was invited to watch the Beatles record this. Yeah, Sgt. Pepper's. If you listen to Piper, it doesn't so much sound like whatever the Beatles are doing. I don't really think Pink Floyd and the Beatles had all that much cross-pollination, but when you listen to the production, there's that same feeling of, you know, freedom and optimism and, you know, possibility that, whoop, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> there's that same feeling of freedom and, you know, unhibited wackiness that some of the best points of Sgt. Pepper's has. The working title of Piper was Projection, and it stayed that way until pretty late in the process. Uh, the title Piper at the Gates of Dawn comes from The Wind in the Willows, which is a book that Sid really liked. As much freedom as the band had conceptually, EMI did have a couple of things that they wanted of the band, and one of these things, which I think is kind of ridiculous, is manageable song lengths. <laughs> I don't know what they were expecting. We think of them as kings of the 10 minute song. I certainly think of them as kings of the 10 minute song, even, you know, getting into 20 minutes. But for the most part, Pink Floyd actually compromised. Uh, the only exception is Interstellar Overdrive, which is nine minutes long, which is totally manageable in Pink Floyd universe. On my track listing, Side A opens up with C. Emily Play. Then we have Power Talk H, followed by Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk, Lucifer Sam, and the first side concludes with Matilda Mother. On Side B, we have The Scarecrow, The Gnome, Chapter 24, and my album is closed out with Interstellar Overdrive. Now, if you have a copy of Piper at the Gates of Dawn in your collection, you might have just heard what my track listing sounds like and thought, my track listing is nothing like your track listing. If you have a UK copy or a more recent repress in your collection, this is probably what your track listing sounds like. Your record would open with Astronomy Domini, then you would have Lucifer Sam, and then Matilda Mother, then Flaming, and then would come Power Talk H. Next would be Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk, and that would be followed by Interstellar Overdrive. Then comes The Gnome and Chapter 24, then The Scarecrow, and your album would conclude with Bike. Why are there two track listings? As a new collector, this would really throw me off. And over time, and really getting into the music of the 60s, I've learned that releasing an album in the UK versus releasing an album in the US, uh, this would be two totally different beasts. Think Rubber Soul. My US copy, it doesn't have Nowhere Man or If I Needed Someone. And these records would sometimes get entirely different titles and packaging. Uh-oh. The Beatles' first entirely uniform release across the UK and the US with, you know, packaging, track listing, album title was Sgt. Pepper's. It kind of helped set the precedent for a uniform track listing. Singles in the UK weren't always singles in the US. We actually saw an example of this in my last Vinyl Monday with uh, Led Zeppelin III. The single on that album was Immigrant Song with Hey Hey What Can I Do on the B-side, and Led Zeppelin never released any singles in the UK. That just wasn't something they did. And singles are most often the factor that shakes up the track listing. I think that's what happened with Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Flaming was released in the US as the single, and it doesn't actually appear on my US copy of the album. Uh, it's also worth noting that Piper was the only full album that Sid Barrett got to participate in. He does appear on one song on A Saucer Full of Secrets, but that was just a feature. By then, his involvement in the band had diminished quite a bit, and after 1968, he was phased out entirely. Um, I do have a post up on my website that goes 
uh, a little more into detail in this chapter of Pink Floyd's history, but I am not choosing to cover Sid Barrett's mental decline in detail on this episode, as it's really not relevant to Piper at the Gates of Dawn. It's more relevant to Dark Side, and it's most relevant to Wish You Were Here. Instead, I'm just gonna be introducing you to Sid Barrett, and I'm just gonna be talking about what he was like at this point in Pink Floyd's history. He was an artist, he enjoyed drawing, he enjoyed painting, as I said before, he did this art, and he did the promotional art for See Emily Play. He liked to read, he also really liked gardening. And if you want a little taste of his personality, I really recommend you go and watch the See Emily Play music video. I'm probably gonna link that in my description. Um, Sid's energy and his enthusiasm and his happiness, you, it's just infectious. Uh, you can see that Sid was carefree and he didn't really take anything too seriously. Um, he did have a music career after he was in Pink Floyd, and it's pretty good. I just listened to the Madcap Laughs this morning, actually. Outsider music is so diverse and so cool. It's not just Sid Barrett, it's, it's Daniel Johnston, it's Wesley Willis, it's Captain Beefheart, and it's the Shags. It's a really rich and fascinating area of music, and if I can get any of that stuff in my collection, I would love to do, you know, a deep dive sometime on this channel. As I mentioned before with the naming of Piper at the Gates of Dawn, Sid Barrett loved The Wind in the Willows, and he especially liked the mythological figure of Pan. Uh, that is just so fitting. It works almost too well. If Pan was a real-life human person, I'm pretty sure he would have manifested himself as Sid Barrett. A guy writing songs about gnomes and bikes and gnomes in space and running around playing a pan flute. Uh, Sid Barrett was the definition of a free spirit. With a personality like Sid Barrett at the helm, this record turned out pretty kooky and people really dug that. This album did pretty well upon release. Uh, it did take on a little bit better in the UK. Pink Floyd tried a tour in the US to support this album and it failed. Piper was successful, but it was nowhere near the magnitude of ubiquity and success that maybe a modern day fan would picture when we hear the name Pink Floyd. That, of course, is thanks to Dark Side. I will not be covering Dark Side anytime soon, I'm very sorry. I wasn't totally sure what to make of Piper at the Gates of Dawn when I first heard it. This record is very much divorced from anything else that Pink Floyd would put out. In the wake of everything else that Pink Floyd would do, uh, this record has become quite divisive. Either you love it or you hate it. So what do I think? I think this record has some way cool stuff going on here. Flaming is great. Um, I'm bummed it's not on my copy, but it's great. If my love of Highway 61 by Bob Dylan is of any indication, I love a good slide whistle. <laughs> I also had to look up what an Ida Down was. <laughs> Thanks for the vocabulary lesson, Sid. <laughs> And I'm just gonna say what everyone is thinking. Power Talk H is so weird. <laughs> like the, the Roger Waters screeches, the Charlie Brown piano. I, I actually can't keep a straight face while listening to the first 30 seconds. After we get through that intro, smooth sailing, great track. I guess this record scratches a good itch in my brain because I like wacky psychedelic music. I like the funky improvisational stuff and I like something that's lighthearted. I will say I am very bummed about the US track listing. The UK track listing is worlds and way better. But the one benefit is I get to see Emily play. I get to see Emily play. I get it and you don't. We dumped your tea in the harbor. I've heard from people that they think Pink Floyd was, their words not mine, better off without Sid Barrett. There's a lot of comparison going on between this Pink Floyd and the other Pink Floyd. Was Sid as formidable 
a songwriter as Roger Waters or as David Gilmour. Sid was just doing different stuff. He wasn't trying to be all like, society man, seven minute guitar solo. <laughs> Sid's songs were a little more inquisitive, um, more whimsical, more fun, and his personality really showed through his lyrics. His voice fits his songs so well. There are few other frontmen who sound quite as British as Sid Barrett. He really didn't try and hamper his accent down at all. And I say if you have an accent and you're a singer, run with it. Just go with it. It's a part of you. Um, this record is a part of Sid that I'm very happy to have. And I think other Pink Floyd fans should be really happy to have as well. I really love Sid, and so did his bandmates. Um, Sid's absence influences quite literally the rest of the band's history and quite a few subsequent albums, most of the albums in Pink Floyd's classic period, actually. Um, I am gutted that Sid Barrett's presence in Pink Floyd uh, that his legacy is just reduced to shine on you crazy diamond. It sucks. I have a soft spot for Sid. I adore him. It makes me really sad that he wasn't able to enjoy his band's legacy with the rest of them. Uh, we don't have to detail the sad parts that aren't relevant to the album, but we also can't edit the sad parts out. Uh, I'm gonna cover my personal favorites. Um, which I always do when I talk about a Vinyl Monday album. Uh, from my track listing, I really like See Emily Play, Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk, Lucifer Sam, and Interstellar Overdrive. And from the track listing that most other people have, I really like Flaming and Astronomy Domini. I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I really want to thank you all for opening your hearts for 10-15 minutes of your day and listening to me openly care about music and musicians that I love. That is a really big deal to me. To have people in my comments telling me how they interact with this music, how they like it or dislike it, and what exactly they love about it. Maybe it's the dirty hippie in me, but I love love. And this is absolutely the dirty hippie in me. I fucking love Pink Floyd. Uh, if you like what I do, you should like this video. Uh, comment what you think of early Pink Floyd, what you think of Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and subscribe for more episodes of Vinyl Monday. And I have so many more thoughts about music that I love that I want to share with you. And I also have so many more album covers to dress like. Thank you so much for watching this video, and hopefully I'll get to see you next week. Bye!